bringing you key insights, tips, and advice from the brightest minds in the Canadian franchising industry. This is the Franchise Canada Chats Podcast. And welcome back to the Franchise Canada Chats podcast. I'm your co-host, Kristen. And I'm Andrew. And today we're joined by Craig. He's the co-founder and CEO of the Local Handyman Group, a home repair service franchise that completes small projects and jobs throughout Canada. The company is known for its quick response time and ability to complete practically any home repair in under four hours. During our interview with Craig, we discussed why he started the Local Handyman Group, what he's looking for in his franchise partners, and what the future holds for the company. So without further ado, here's our interview with Craig. All right, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the Local Handyman Group? Sure. Uh, So Local Handyman Group is a collection of brands across uh, Canada. So we obviously denote all of our brands by area code. So on um, 604 Handyman is the Greater Vancouver, Fraser Valley area, 780 Handyman's in Edmonton, 403 Handyman's in Calgary, 306 in Regina and 519 Handyman Southern Ontario. So those are some of the current locations we have. And obviously as we expand, we would add, you know, 204 Handyman to Winnipeg and, um, you know, 905 to, to the rest of Ontario or 416. So we really are a, I would say niche handyman slash handy woman business that really focuses on those, small projects and repairs. And I think that uh, differentiates the brand a bit from a lot of contractors who say that they're handymen, but really they're trying to get those large projects where our systems are really based around um, successfully and profitably doing the smaller projects. So tell us a bit about what motivated you to start a franchise business in the home care and maintenance space. Sure. I think, I think any good, great brand starts with a personal need. Um, for us, you know, it's the Genesis story that I tell so often on um, discovery calls with franchise partners or potential um, franchise partners is my wife had a need for a handyman. I'm handy myself, but at the time I was working in Vancouver, commuting from White Rock. It's about an hour and a half in, uh, in our traffic with uh, bridges and tunnels. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do was put up a new light fixture or change out the squeaky fan or the leaky faucet, whatever it may be. And uh, my wife, Kristen said, you know, I've reached out to 10 handymen, seven I wouldn't want in my house, uh, two are too expensive because they're contractors and charging too much for a call out fee. And the one guy that really is in that handyman niche uh, is booked out three weeks. Mm-hmm. She was really well connected in, um, with mommy groups, et cetera, because we have a, a five-year-old. So at the time he was uh, a little guy. And um, even in those groups, there was this, anyone have a handyman that is branded, insured, will show up. Even if it's not on time, we'll just show up and do a small job. So with that, uh, my wife said, I really want to start a handyman company. And I said, well, you know nothing about handymanning. You're not handy yourself. And you haven't been in the construction home improvement world ever. And she looked at me and she's very A-type, which uh, (laughs) makes it uh, a really fun household um, in a good, positive way. But she looked and said, I'm great with people. I'm great with marketing and sales. And so are you. So let's start this. And 604 Handyman was born. um, And we looked at what, who our clients were. They were either older folks that were, and I'm holding up air quotes, aging in place. So looking at how do they stay in their home longer, repair things, make it you know, more comfortable to live in, some grab bars, whatever it may be. And then there was also on the opposite end of the spectrum, this millennial group that were either uh, too busy or didn't have the skill set to be able to fix some of the little things. And I'm generalizing, but I'm looking at two opposite ends of the spectrum. And we said, well, how do we speak to these folks with a clear, concise website that has everything that they need up front? Um, And then how do we deliver? And um, as you know, with franchising, I can't make earnings claims, but I can say that the first month that Kristen launched, she knocked it out of the park to the point that I picked up the phone, called my lawyer, said we wanted to franchise this across Canada. I have a lot of franchising uh, background anyway, and we kind of launched 
local handyman group from then and looked at what people wanted. They wanted this local feel, local vibe. It's much easier doing just one brand across the country. It's an easier sales marketing play, but sometimes the easier parts uh, aren't the best in the business. And, you know, it was quite evident when we launched in Regina where our franchise partners, Mike and Ashley there said, people love that it's 306 Handyman. They get that we're local and that we have the same systems and branding, et cetera, that we use across Canada. So that really was the a bit of the genesis story as to how we started and, and you know, why we looked at that real local handyman feel and, and vibe. Mm -hmm. So it was less than a year from when you first opened in BC to when you decided to start franchising? So it was about three months. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, and we, we had some early adopters, obviously some, some folks that we network with, uh, ex-colleagues and, and, um, and some friends where we said, we believe in this, we believe in the vision, um, and we launched three locations really quickly. Uh, and then it really took off from there. We, we have a strong background in franchising and systems and all that type of stuff with, with uh, my past experience and my wife's. And um, yeah, we were able to, you know, duplicate brands in different markets and, and use the same tactics and tools that lots of franchises use to, you know, give people that springboard in a market. But yeah, it was pretty quick. So where, can you tell us a bit about where the system is at now? How many, how many franchises do you have? So in the last 16 months, we've expanded to five brands in four provinces. We have um, currently eight franchise partners and 18 territories. So I think on the validation side that I've loved is our Regina franchise bought half the city and six months later, we're happy enough that they bought the other half. Mm -hmm. Our Calgary folks, uh, which is um, two brother-in-laws and their family bought Airdrie and North West Calgary. And we're happy enough that we sat down, went through a business plan, et cetera, with them and more of their family got on board and bought the rest of the, the city. So we're seeing our franchise partners expanding. And then we currently have um, six people that have been disclosed in different markets. Uh, so we're looking at, yeah, adding a number of more locations in the next uh, four to six weeks. So yeah, tell me a bit about a bit more about those franchise partners. Um, you know, what's the unifying theme among them? Like, what makes the uh, ideal franchisee within your system? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So, I think the ideal candidate is someone who is is driven, um, who has a vision and wants to be a part of something bigger. Um, but still understands that it's their business. So we really look for a cultural fit is number one. You know, I had franchise partners at the end of last year ask me, Craig, what's your job in 2019? And I have two roles really is um, national accounts, which makes everyone stronger. And we've actually, we've added a few, which is very exciting. And the other part is a promise that I've made to all of our franchise partners currently is that we will do the best we can to vet Candidates that come in, it's not just about a, a check, it's about the right person. So when we do discovery calls, we look at, is there a um, business morals and ethics fit in how people operate in general, in their life and or in their business? We look at, are they a good communicator? We look at, can they execute on a plan? Because really at the end of the day, you know, you don't have to be a handyman or handy woman. You don't have to be a home improvement guru, um, but you need some of those soft skills. We can help you with marketing and sales and operational tactics and procedures, etc. But it really is that fit of like-minded people. Um, the one thing I used to work at One Air Got Junk for a decade, and the one thing Brian Scudamore, I think, really did a good job of of teaching all of us was the fact that do the backyard barbecue test. So can you have all of your franchise partners at a backyard barbecue and everyone would feel like they fit? Not everyone's the same. We're not a bunch of lemmings <laughs> running for the cliff. Um, but really, 
is there a fit of like-minded people? And I can tell you, I love the franchise partners we have right now. And we certainly in discovery calls validate for that fit more than anything. And you said earlier that you and your wife didn't have any handyman experience other than, I guess, daily tasks around the house. Um, so I'm assuming you don't look for franchisees who have a background in home improvement or it's not as, an, as, as important to you. Yeah, so it depends on the candidate. Um, our franchisee in the Edmonton area, we have one territory there and, and a few more still available. Um, he's an owner operator. So he is a ex-electrician. Well, I guess an electrician, now a, a handyman. Um, and so when he looked at the business, he said, Craig, this is what I want. I want this territory. I want to be my own boss. I want to have, you know, I want to make X amount of money, which will make me happy. And I want to be the owner operator. I don't want a bunch of employees. So in that market, we looked at, okay, Kevin, what's your skill set? He's way handier than a handyman even needs to be, but he wanted to be the technician. And he was then, you know, quite open and honest with us to say, this is my weakness, whether it's social media, marketing, tying together all those pieces. So when you look at the owner operator model, certainly you need to be handy. Uh, when you look at the, let's call it manager slash investor model, you do not need to be handy. 65% of our um, franchise partners are female and most of them have not been in the industry. They're amazing with customers. They're amazing with um, managing their handyman and communication. Um, and they're kicking a lot of the guys' butts. So you certainly do not need um, a handyman background, but there are times when if you're gonna be the owner operator, you certainly need to know what you're doing to uh, be successful. And how do you, is there a process that you go through with your franchise partners to help them find handymen uh, yeah. to, that you do? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, so part of, I mean, I think with any business, I think we can all attest to um, people are the biggest part of the business, whether it's a, an amazing part of the business or a real pain in the you know what. So what we do is we take our franchise partners through um, how to post for the job, um, how to interview, what to look for, and then we have a couple of tips and tricks on a second interview, which is a, a bit of a practical interview to make sure that you're vetting people on skill set of being a handyman. How do they operate on site? What do they do with tools? What do they do with garbage? All that type of stuff. So we give, we give certainly, I think, some really good tools and tips and tricks on how to hire that handyman. So, yeah, so you mentioned a little bit about the support you provide in terms of the hiring process. Tell us a bit more about the overall uh, training and ongoing support that you provide as a franchisor. Sure. Yeah, good question. Um, so we do initial training, as I think a lot of brands do. So we do a couple of days where it's, it's quite intensive. Um, if it's a classroom style with more than one candidate, we will go over the system as a whole. If it is, say, one candidate coming in, we will do a bit of pre-screening in regards to what are their strengths and weaknesses and then where we'll spend a little bit more time. So we certainly do customize the two days of training. But in general, um, our two days of training is certainly a lot on the CRM system and the back end tools that we use on how to manage your schedule, how to you know put in a work order, how to convert it to uh, an invoice, how to manage your leads, how to, you know, get paid, how to link up all of your marketing um, tools, whether it's that social, online, print, and guerrilla, how do you do all of that stuff? And then it really comes down to our operational systems as well in regards to what do you do with the lead? How do you convert it? What do you then do with um, the job once you have it? So there's pre-job, on-site, post-job um, systems that we take people through that I think Again, there's more touch points with the customer, and I think it makes, in our mind, us a better experience for our handyman service and someone else's. Um, we have on ongoing, so we take we take you through a launch. After your launch and training, we obviously sit down with you. We help build your marketing plan, which is a four-week plan, which we then duplicate, and then we look at the first quarter 
we work out from there. We have um, ongoing coaching calls. And then what we also do is one of our franchise partners might reach out and say, hey, I want to do um, a program with home inspectors, i.e. we just did this in Calgary. So we want to do a program with home inspectors. Can you sit down with us virtually and go through how we're going to approach this and how do we structure a deal? So we'll take those projects, I think, will certainly be ongoing because we're finding vertical sales verticals that we never even thought of as the business scales and grows. Um, but there's that online, on, sorry, ongoing coaching and helping with project management and intros to national accounts, et cetera, that uh, just extend on from the initial launch and training, et cetera. And just to backtrack a little bit here, what types of services does the brand provide in terms of um, home repair and handyman work? Yeah, so good question. So for us, as I said, the brand evolves, and I think that's the beauty of franchising is more minds versus one. So we had a, you know, a set of systems and what's our B2C and B2B business, and then it's evolved as all of these smart franchise partners are coming in and enlightening us on a few things. But um, the brand as a whole right now focuses on small repairs and small projects. And when I say that, we will talk about uh, door slams open with the wind and the doorknob goes through the, the wall and it's a three inch hole. Most uh, drywall companies will not unpack their van to patch a three inch hole because they know it's a pain in the rear. You have to come back two or three times to sand it and feather it out, etc. We will do that because our systems are designed around doing jobs close together and we can go from one job to another and in between pop in for that 10 minutes to do the sanding and pop back out again. Changing a faucet, changing a light switch. So we do everything, think of it at the end of a line. We don't rough in plumbing, we're not plumbers. We're not gas fitters, we're not electricians. But if you need something changed at the end of a line, we can do that. We'll swap out a light fixture, we won't put in um, new pot lights, as an example. Um, we do a ton of TV mounting, putting together furniture, putting up those curtain rods and blinds that are maybe at that awkward height that someone can't reach. Um, what else do we do? Um, I'm trying to think of some of the basics. Well, we do a lot of gate repairs. So we have found on the B2B side that a chunk of our franchise partners are doing a lot of strata homeowners association work. So we'll find replacing gate latches or a couple of fence pickets. Again, we're not a fencing company. We're not a, a building maintenance company, but we will go in and fill that gap. And that's where I think people really like to have us in the back pocket to go. We need two hours worth of fence pickets and gate latches done. Call 604 Handyman or 519, wherever they are. They are. Um, and that's great. We need to have a faucet replaced, but we don't want a minimum call from a plumber and we can do that quite easily. So I think that's where we've hit the sweet spot where people understand that we can do that. Plus we're insured, plus we have workers comp, easy online booking, all that type of stuff where our repeats are usually booking online. Our first time customers usually call us to find out more about the service. Um, but it's all those small little things, 30 feet of baseboard that no one is gonna come back and do. Um, that we can pop in and do a half a you know closet of tile or hardwood or whatever it is that just needs to be finished. We'll go in and do it. So it's those tiny little things that I think we've we, we've really found a niche and because of how we schedule in our systems, etc. Um, a franchise partner can do that profitably versus another guy trying to cover an entire city is not going to drive from one end to the other and do two hours worth of driving for a one hour job. The way we have it structured, we can do that for people. And the turnaround time is a lot faster because um, you can do multiple small jobs in a day. You're not locked into a two-week bathroom reno and you're not answering your calls or being able to get to customers. So from a prospective franchisee's perspective, someone looking to invest in a franchise, why, why should they be looking at the home improvement market? I, I guess it's a bit of a recession-proof sector in that regard. Yeah, it was funny. As I was prepping for this call, I, I said to my wife, I'm like, it is recession proof, but it sounds it, it sounds so cliche. Um, 
So I think when you're looking at the home improvement market, number one, recession or not, and I guess recessions are often based on home value and how people, how wealthy people feel. Um, but it really does help in a hot market. People are buying and selling and there's move in, move out. There's little things to do. That's great for us in a slower market. Um, there's people that are going to say, Hey, we're, we're going to be here for the next couple of years. Let's make it nice. And you don't have to do a massive reno to make it nice. There's little things you can do. Uh, on the flip side to that, there's a customer base. We have the largest group of folks retiring and their parents. So the boomers and then the civics, their parents that are either aging in place in their homes that need help or are moving into homes that need help. Uh, and when I look at that massive transition, we have the next 15, 20 years of a fantastic market. We also have a younger generation who are busy, who are mobile. Um, as an example, in Vancouver, there are, are a lot of renters because of the prices of homes that need help, need something done. A land, um, a homeowner that's renting something out needs help. So. I think when you're looking at, you know, multiple segments of demo and then also multiple segments of the economy, uh, I think it's a really, really good time. And I think that's why the brand's done quite well um, right now, because I think it's, you know, what do they say? It's a bit of luck, a bit of timing and a bit of hard work. And uh, I think all of those are actually falling into place with where the um, home repair slash reno world is right now. And are there are there any specific housing markets in Canada that you, you really have your eyes on and are hoping, you know, that you can find a franchisee to operate in? Yeah. So, you know, it's really funny with this brand. And I think it's because we, we really preach the mantra of live, work, play in your community that we have had a lot of success in the burbs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look at, uh, Vancouver and the Fraser Valley as an example. We actually have someone disclosed right now for Vancouver, but that was a market that I thought the west side of Vancouver is what has some of the most expensive real estate and affluent um, neighborhoods in Canada. And I thought, man, someone is going to buy that first, develop it and just have a, a killer franchise because of the market. What did we end up selling? All of the burbs, none of the, <laughs> none of the metro areas. And I think it's because people were tired of commuting. They want to live and work in their community. They want to be a bigger part of it. They want to have a presence there. So when I look at markets, um, we do not have anyone in Winnipeg right now. So we're looking at Winnipeg um, because this can be an owner operator and or investor model. It really opens it up to, and it's a lot lower overhead. So it opens it up to a lot of smaller markets. So um, Saskatoon's a great market. Uh, when I look at BC, there's Prince George and the island. Um, but our focus has been uh, Winnipeg because I would close out the provinces from BC to Ontario. We have four markets still or four territories still available in Edmonton. I, I lived in Edmonton for 10 years, so I have a connection there. My family's there and I do want to sell out that market because it is a strategic city to say we serve as X amount of the main metros in Western Canada. Um, and then there's been a focus on the markets that are left in Vancouver, Fraser Valley, because that really is home based for us. And um, we want to sell out there. So but we, we talk to a lot of folks that are in smaller markets and see the opportunity and, and the model really works there. So. Um, so, yeah, a couple of key focuses, but really from Ontario out to uh, B.C., there there's there's still lots available. And down the line, do you ever consider moving down to the States as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the States is 10 times the size of the, the market up here. Um, when I was with 1-800-GOT-JUNK, 85% of our revenue came from the States, even though we had launched in Canada. It's just it's just the market space, but it is there is complexity. You know, Canada has a couple of different regulations per province on franchising, who you, when you can disclose and not, et cetera. Uh, the U.S. has 14 registration states. Uh, you need to have someone down there. It's expensive going down. So quite frankly, for us, we really want to focus on on Canada, building out the market. I say two to four years, but I mean, 
we've grown quite a bit in the last 18 months that two to four years might seem far out or might not um, is I think it'll be two to four years before we go into the US and we're going to look at um, I think how we can disrupt the franchise market in different ways on licensing and how we look at the whole franchise model down there. We've got some interesting ideas, but uh, but for now, yeah, it's a, it's a main focus on on Canada. Great. Yep. So you you know you've given us a great look of what your system looks like and some of the benefits. Um, what so walk me through the franchise recruitment process. Let's say I was ready to make the next step. Uh, what would the process look like for me? Sure. So we have a couple of um, avenues we go down with lead gen, you know, like we're part of the CFA obviously, and um, we get some leads that come in with uh, the information we have there. And then we market through, you know, social media and, and online um, um, marketing tactics that we use to drive leads. We then go through a validation process of um, a little bit more info on the brand, the investment, all that type of stuff. And then once we have a validated candidate, we set up a discovery call. And I think it, it again, probably sounds cliche, but we don't sell franchises in our mind. We award them. So it's really looking for the right person and the fit. So on the discovery call, um, I'll do it with our franchise development um, sales, um, sales guy. And uh, he probably hates when I start the call to say, this is not a sales call. This is a info call on you, Mr. and Mrs. Candidate, and us, um, local handyman group. And I think it kind of sets the tone that you are going to get information on a discovery call, and we want information on the discovery call. And I think it's important to find that there's that fit. Earlier, we talked about the, the whole cultural fit. And I get a gut feel, you know, within the first 10 or 15 minutes based on where the questions are going, how they're asked um, from the candidate. So that discovery call truly is super valuable to anyone that wants to look at any brand. And I think during that time, um, you need to take in all the information, ask all the questions that you can, and we answer them very candidly. And at the end of the call, I always tell people, first, our franchise development guy will say, <laughs> um, so do you want to move on to the next uh, step and get disclosed? And I always say, sleep on it. If you wake up in the morning and you are more pumped about this brand than you are now, then give us a shout, shoot us an email, we'll disclose you. If you wake up and you are not excited the next day after getting this information, please do not do it because you will be making a mistake for yourself and for us. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that really helps because we're not, we're here, yes, to push the brand and get people excited about it, but you have to be driven and see the potential of the brand in your market and get really excited about it. And that part to me is the next day someone wakes up and goes, I can see this, I can do this, I'm pumped. Okay, let me get the info and go through that long FDD. That's, um, that's the part that you then start the discovery phase on. So the step then is we disclose you. So in most of the provinces, except Saskatchewan, but in most of the provinces in, in Canada, you have to disclose a franchise partner where you send them a document, they sign off and date it that says, it's March 11th, I've been disclosed today, they sign, there's no commitment either way, but it just really timestamps the, the uh, discovery process. And there's a 14 day, um, let's call it, uh, fact finding slash cool off period where you don't want to get someone all raw raw jazzed and try and get a check out of them. I am very happy that that 14 day period is in place because it gives people the opportunity to go through the document. You know, franchise disclosure documents are very much the same across all markets. There's a very small part that really is brand specific, but it is 150 pages of legalese that's painful to read. Uh, but you need to go through and understand what's required of you, what's required of the franchise partner. During that phase, we also give people a market study. So understand your market. Who are the players there? What do you, what's your experience when you call another handyman? And I, and quite often, 
um, those markets, people will go, oh, I'm glad I did the market study because there are some really awful players out here and there, hey, there's a couple of really good ones who I'd be competing with. When you get through that process, we chat again um, and make sure that there's an absolute fit. When you get through that 14 day period, at that point, you should have enough information where you've done a market study, you've spoken to other franchise partners, you've spoken to the franchisor again, that it really comes down to, okay, what's the territory, the size, the cost, because we charge per um, territory, which is 125,000 people in population. We look at that, we then cut the maps, put everything together, and that's where you sit down and enter into a franchise agreement. Uh, you fund it, and we take you through a launch process where we determine a launch date, and then we really just reverse engineer our launch process to say, we're gonna hold your hand through this whole thing. Because launching a business, for someone doing it on, by themselves versus say a franchise is, when do I get a corp, bookkeeper what, sign up for, this license, do this, credit card processing, and it seems quite overwhelming. And we have a checklist that just takes you through and you're gonna do these two or three or four things this week, then you're gonna do the following week. And you know, kind of like the saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Uh, we take you through that so that come your launch date, you've crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's, um, and then we can focus on marketing, lead gen, conversion, operational excellence, um, referrals, repeat, all that type of stuff. So it is, it's a very structured process that is in place to make sure we get everything done. We get it done on time, that we're there to help you. And then essentially, we believe we're giving you a springboard to success that you can go further and faster with our brand than doing it yourself. And so for people who reach out to you and have expressed interest, what was, what's the timeline between that moment and when they actually open their franchise or does it all vary depending on the franchisee and their location? You know what, it, not even the location, it, it does vary on the franchisee. What is your expectation? So our London launch was extremely fast um, because we wanted to do it before Christmas. And, and it was, I, I told our franchise partners, I will go as fast as you can handle. Um, but usually you go into say a discovery call, um, by the time you're disclosed and you're gonna do, let's call it do a deal, it's anywhere from four to six weeks. And then I would say another six weeks on launch. So you're looking at, you know, from the first call to actually starting anywhere between two, two and a half months um, that you could actually be open. Some people, however, say, hey, Craig, I'm moving from here to here. I want to get going at this point. And then again, with the launch, we'll say, okay, we'll do the deal and you're a fit. And then we just reverse engineer that launch date is X we'll work backwards and say, we're gonna start at this point and then take you towards it. But two to three months is from call to launch um, isn't unrealistic. Right. And you said that you were in franchising before you became a franchisor. Yep. Is there anything that surprised you or that's really different, um, challenging or easier to being a franchisee compared to being a franchisor? You know, it's interesting. Um, so I've been, I've been the franchisor on, I was on the leadership team with One Air Got Junk. I launched Wow One Day Painting, one of their emerging brands um, for Brian. That was eye-opening going from, you know, a few systems to really building it out. For myself, building our own brand, um, I think it's interesting for all entrepreneurs is that two things that are really surprising. One, it can be lonely. When you're an entrepreneur, you sometimes find yourself sitting there going, wow, it's me, it's my dollars, it's my ups and downs. What I love about franchising is you have, if you have the right people in the system, you have an amazing group of people that are going through what you're going through and doing exactly what you're doing and they're in the same business. So it takes the loneliness away. The other part that I find um, interesting is the, the highs and lows so that 
you know, uninformed optimism, informed pessimism, and riding that roller coaster of hero to zero to hero to zero, where one day you're on top of the world, you look at your schedule and you're like, this is amazing. And the next day someone cancels or something happens and you're like, what the heck is going on? Um, so I think that was surprising for me. And on the, on the franchisor side, you know, when you're passionate about your business and you're passionate about your franchisees being successful, we're out of startup as a franchisor now, but I still ride those roller coasters with every one of our franchise partners that launches because I'm with them on the highs and the lows, the phone calls of this is amazing. Look at my schedule or I just got did a deal with um, this big company. I'm going to get X amount of hours a month from them to a call of Ugh, this week. What's going on? And maybe it's, you know, spring break or the weather across Canada has been just crazy this year and it, it affects business for everyone. So I think that, yeah, the, the emotional toll that it takes on people, um, I think surprised me even more when you're looking at, you know, your own do dollars and cents and you look at your bank account and you know what you're, you believe in the vision, you believe in the dream, you're executing on it, you know it's going to happen, but you go through this stage um, of, in, let, <laughs> you're in a world of emotion. And that's probably what, uh, because they always say take the feelings out of business, but it's not possible. So for, for franchisees, what advice would you give in terms of, you know, setting goals and expectations just to temper that roller coaster a little bit? So we, we go through um, a first year budgeting tool with our franchise partners. So we really say, this is our average job size. This is what we would think you would be doing, executing on the basic systems. So, you know, week one to week four, so month one, looks like this based on your market. And here's the expectation. So it is certainly going through that. Most people that entrepreneurs, most are A-type, most want to push, 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 push. And if you say budget on X, in their minds, they always have, I'm going to do two or three times more than that. So we really do look at the quality of the customer, try not to do a hundred jobs when you start because you're going to mess some of them up. Let's get your systems worked out, get your handyman worked out, repeat. So our repeat, um, our, our, our say annual value of a customer right now, our average job size is $292. Um, and our, our repeat is usually two to three times a year. So customers worth about a thousand dollars a year, um, based on system wide numbers right now. So we really try and take people through taking those numbers, applying it to a budget, being realistic. Um, I think that helps. And then there's also, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Cause different people have our Edmonton franchise, Kevin, awesome guy wants to just be the owner operator just landed a deal with Aurora Cannabis, had to hire a part-time guy. And he's like, Craig, what the hell? I just wanted to do an owner-operator model. And he's doing very well, which is a good thing. But now he has to look at, so now he has this HR component with it that he didn't really want because he just wanted to be the technician. Um, and so, you know, it's a new set of, of challenges. But I think we do a pretty good job on setting expectation. But I do believe we look for overachievers so everyone has in mind, I am going to be a superstar. It is going to go quickly. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it takes a bit of time to get traction. Um, but you have to be aware that you're a new business um, and that you need to execute. It's easy to have vision and grandiose ideas, but you need to go out and are you executing on those guerrilla tactics by owning that neighborhood, by you know doing the follow-up that other people don't do by closing the loop on certain um, processes or lead gen tactics, whatever you're doing, those little things are hard and that you're easy to easily distracted from them. So we try and tie all that together to temper it. But I think everyone wants to be the hero and wants to do the highest revenue and all that type of stuff. But um, we try our best to keep people grounded. They know what they're going to do. They know they're going to be successful. It just it takes some time. Great. And on that note, we have some franchise fun questions for okay. you. So I'm going to read a statement and then you can fill in the blank. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. The most interesting thing I've done recently is. Ooh. Um. <laughs> on a business level or on a personal level? Either. Yeah. Both. Business or personal. The most interesting thing I've done of late. This podcast. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, possibly. Uh, <laughs> interesting thing we've done of late. Um, we've been pushing PR a bit, and we're uh, doing a piece in um, Fresh Magazine where my wife's going to be featured, and it's it's pretty cool to go through the process of um, the interview and getting things ready. So uh, that'll be neat. That's on Wednesday. So, but the workup has been the interesting part to it. Great. In its best form, work is? Fun. A good franchisee? Will believe in the vision and follow the systems. A good franchisor? will support their franchise partners as their first customer. The most important thing in life is? Your word. If I could meet anyone dead or alive? Tom Brady. <laughs> the person who has had the most positive influence on me as a business person is? Brian Scudamore. Canadian franchising is? Interesting. My personal motto is? Glass is always half full. And finally, one necessary item on my life's to-do list is? You'll sense a general theme here. Take my son to Foxborough to watch Tom Brady play before he retired. <laughs> to win one more Super Bowl, right? One more. Yes. <laughs> one, my my five-year-old says that I'm obsessed. I think he has one more in him, I think. <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Craig. You're very welcome. Appreciate it. And uh, if you need anything else, please reach out. Don't forget to subscribe to the Franchise Canada Chats podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. For more, head to franchisecanada.online.